to the Jacob Edwards Library, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, who is Dr. Jean M. Borgatti, who is here to present her program, American Ar African Artists, Traditional, Modern, Global. And it's very exciting to have Jean back here again to present another aspect of the cultural competencies and uh, the varieties that exist in Africa and help us to understand some of these uh, interesting differences. Um, I would like to thank the uh, trustees of the Jacob Edwards Library for supporting this program as part of one of their presentations through the 100th year, which is this year, and we'll be continuing to celebrate until May 2015. I would also like to thank the friends of the library for providing my refreshments this evening, and I hope everybody will be free to uh, partake. Um, I will just read a little uh, introduction to uh, Dr. Bugatti before the program gets started. Um, Jean Borgatti is a research fellow at Clark University. She is a visiting fellow at Boston University in the African Studies Center. And she is also the consulting curator um, at Fitchburg Art Museum, where she is uh, involved with the African and Oceanic Art Collection. Um, so I would hope that Jean will give some, um, of some more biographical information as we go by. Um, you may remember her from um, a being a previous exhibitor here uh, about four years ago, and there are some photographs on our Flickr account of that beautiful exhibit that was on display here for, the, for a month previously. So welcome, everybody, and let's give a warm welcome to Jean Bogatti. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about African artists today. Uh, not only traditional artists, but I do want to talk about them too, uh, but also modern artists and, in fact, global artists. Uh, Africa is global. We live in a global world. And if you look at this map, the, the, you probably can't read the, whoops, sorry about that. You can't read this, but it's, this is uh, 100,000 people of African descent. That's where the red, where the red uh, parts of the world are. Obviously, the African continent um, is full of people of African descent. But you also have uh, France, England, uh, Portugal, uh, part of probably Holland and Belgium. Here, all of those were uh, countries that had colonies uh, in Africa and in the New World. And of course, it was as a, can you leave the lights off? Oh, okay. That's fine. That's better, better, better to see the pictures with. Uh, but also, of course, the United States, the Caribbean, uh, Canada, a large chunk of Central America, and the large chunk of Latin America all have large populations of African descent. So African artists actually live not only in Africa, but in a lot of other places as well. Uh, not only are African artists or artists of African heritage global in where they live and where they reach. But there are many ways to be an African artist today, many more ways than there were, say, 150 years ago uh, to be an African artist. You could be uh, trained, and it largely has comes down to do with how you, how you were trained, how you learned to be an artist, how you learned to do what it was that you uh, were going to do. And of course, historically, people learned by the apprenticeship method and often from somebody uh, within the family. Not always, but, but that was, it tended to happen that way. Uh, Duga Agniko is a traditional African carver from Nigeria. Uh, he is actually probably, I, I expect he is, as we would say in Nigeria, late now, uh, that I say he has passed. Uh, Nikkei Davies learned from her great-grandmother how to do the, uh, the textile designing and techniques which were traditional and from which she has built an incredible business. I mean, you can, I mean she's a gorgeous woman, um, and she always looks absolutely spectacular. Um, but she uh, learned through the apprenticeship method. She now has three galleries, in, uh, one in Lagos, which is the business capital of Nigeria, one in Abuja, the political capital of Nigeria, and one in the town of Ashoko, which is where she started. Uh, and I first met her actually in the 1980s when she would come with her suitcases full of the things that she made uh, to the African <coughs> Studies meetings and set up a booth and, and sell to people who were giving papers and who 
had a fondness for Africa as well as an intellectual interest in Africa and so on. Well, she's now got a website and you know the whole nine yards. But she's uh, been a very successful businesswoman and she teaches. She runs workshops on a regular basis for women and youths to, without charge to teach them to how to do these things so that, and she markets their products to give them a cash, you know, a, a, some cash, some independence from as women from their husbands uh, and y young men because they don't have jobs. Unemployment is a problem everywhere, but it's a real problem, even greater problem in uh, some other parts of the world. So besides the traditional methods of learning through apprenticeship, today, of course, artists uh, go to art school. They go to universities and they go to art school. Uh, Sakari Douglas Tamp, this is, a young, this is a young woman, she's got, she, the reason she, you can't, you can't see her hair is because she has her welder's goggles on. She works in metal, which she could not do if she were still living in Nigeria because women do not work with metal, uh, historically in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, but <coughs> definitely not where she comes from in the Niger Delta. And this is one of her pieces, it's a large scale over life-size welded metal sculpture of a masquerade figure uh, from the southern Nigerian area. Uh, El Anatsui, who is not Nigerian but who has lived in Nigeria and taught at the University uh, Art uh, since the 1970s, creates these extraordinary metal textiles uh, out of recycled bottle caps, uh, can lids, kinds of things, I mean, you wouldn't think something so ex incredibly beautiful could be made out of such rubbish, but they in fact are incredibly beautiful. I can tell you now they started a million dollars. I mean, he and Sakari Douglas Camp are both what I would call transnational artists. They serve much, much more an international clientele, not a clientele based uh, more in uh, their own home communities. So there are many ways to be an African artist today. You can, uh, and many kinds of art that is made as a result of this. Many uh, artists today still make things the way they used to make them. Uh, carving wooden masks um, and painting them and using them in the same or maybe even somewhat evolved contexts than they were used 100 years ago or uh, 150 years ago. But you see here a classic mask from the country of Gabon. Uh, and you see it here being used, photographed in the 1990s. African artists also uh, work in what I would call a traditional modern way, in the sense that they make things for their use in their own communities, not for sale to the outside world, but uh, using new kinds of materials, materials that are now um, increasingly available to them because of the, and have been in the case of cotton fabrics, you know, for, for a very long period of time, but, but still increasingly available, increasingly um, affordable. And this reminds me, looking at this particular piece, one of the things that I was going to do when I showed you that Global Africa slide was to put in a plug for the exhibit that I'm curating, which will open in November in Fitchburg. Because one of the things as we go along, I'll point out to the things that you can see if you go to Fitchburg in November to the Fitchburg Art Museum. Uh, the exhibit, which is called Global Africa, Creativity, Continuity, and Change in African Art. And one of the things you will see is this particular mask made by an artist named Pius uh, Ahikbe, uh, who uh, passed away in 2010, but he made this, this uh, on commission in 1979, and it will be on display uh, in Fitchburg. Modern materials uh, or new materials, new motifs, characterize much of the, tr the kind of modern traditional art. And so you see here, this is even uh, newer kinds of materials, uh, plastic dolls. Now these, in fact, are extremely practical because they're very light. So you saw how the, the, figure, the masqueraders danced. Well, that means something that's really light can be danced much more easily and balanced on, on the head and maintained. Uh, they also are not subject to the same kind of deterioration that wood is uh, in, with the dampness in the humid, humid tropical environment or with insect damage. 
So they're actually quite practical. And of course, they have the advantage in this case of being kind of exciting because they were modern and they were new when they were first. But this, this photograph was taken in the early 1970s when I first went to Nigeria to do research. So it was actually taken quite a long time ago now. And in this case, you have a, a carved wooden headdress, which has multiple tiers. Um, and it features, uh, of course, it's painted with oil-based paints, not used in no earth pigments, uh, as it would in the old days would have been done. And you have a group of figures here which represent a band. You can see somebody playing an accordion. And there's, I can't see what he's playing from here, but it might be a, a wind instrument. Or, um, but it, and they're, wear, they're dressed in green. Those are Nigerian army uniforms. This photograph was taken uh, again in the early 70s, just after the Nigerian Civil War was ended. And of course, the Nigerian, the army was a feature of the landscape throughout the country. And so they, as a feature of the landscape, become part of the feature of the uh, visual culture that, that people made uh, or created to uh, display in their annual uh, masquerade festivals. And the top figure here, of course, is an airplane. So it's uh, uh, new motifs reflecting changing life, lifestyles and changing life situations. Okay, Africa's artists have also invented new things, new images, to meet old needs. Uh, this is a uh, memorial figure for a grave, for a graveyard, or uh, to mark the, the grave of an important man, and it's done in a very naturalistic, very lifelike way, which is not like historic African art, which is highly stylized, as you can see from the little, little figures that I have here. Um, and the figure you have here is a what was called a an FAV. You know, we have SUVs. Well, this is an FAV, a fantastic afterlife vehicle, otherwise known as a coffin. And they are made for people who um, whose families want to send them home in proper style. They're expensive. They are buried, but they usually are made in in using an image which celebrates the life of the individual who is uh, being interred. Just so it's a reference to that. But if you come, we don't have an elephant in Fitchburg, but we do have an FAV, and it's in, the, it's in the form of a 57 Chevy. I thought that, that resonated a little bit more with our community than perhaps an elephant or a cocoa pod or a even a Mercedes Benz. Business women will often be buried in a Mercedes Benz FAV. Um, so if you come in November, you will see our, our, our FAV. There are also new forms made for new purposes or new circumstances, something which I guess we would call folk art uh, historically, uh, but particularly for sale and use by local people, but in urban contexts. And the urban, urban life is a little, uh, although it's not new anymore. I mean, it's, you know, it's getting on to being fit, you know, 60, 70 years old now. Uh, but increasingly, life is urbanized in many parts of the world. And so here we have the back ends of, of the transport trucks, also called lorries, and after the, the British way. Uh, with, this one has a Statue of Liberty on it. It probably comes from eastern Nigeria, uh, which is the, what was called Biafra during the Nigerian Civil War. That was the side that we backed. And so we have a lot of longstanding relationship with the people of eastern Nigeria. Um, they lost, the Peace Corps left, and hasn't been back since to Nigeria. They've never been invited back. Um, and here you have just paintings that are made, which people use, buy to decorate their apartments and their homes in the urban areas. In this case, we're not in Nigeria, we're in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. If I use a lot of examples from Nigeria, there are two reasons. One, I worked in Nigeria over a 40-year period, and I'm going back five days after, or three days after my show opens in November, I'll be going back to Nigeria to teach. Um, and the other reason is, one out of every four black Africans is a Nigerian. 
It's an incredibly densely populated country. It's not the biggest in terms of land area, but it is the most densely populated. Uh, and there's a, have a wide range of cultures within that population, so a lot of things are produced at, uh, and made. Okay. African artists also make things uh, which they sell to outsiders but don't use themselves. Tourist art, airport art, as it's called. And this actually has probably been done, probably even before this, but certainly we know it's been done since at least this, the, the 16th century. This is something called an Afro-Portuguese ivory. It's made of carved of ivory. It's from the city of Benin, which is where I teach, uh, in southern Nigeria. Um, or originally was from there. But it was made specifically for a Portuguese merchant or uh, to bring back as a gift probably to the person who sponsored his ship. Um, and so you have here the Portuguese merchant <coughs> being depicted and you have the sailing ship on the lid. This a salt cellar is really a dish. It's a container for salt and it has a co removable cover and this is where the salt would have been kept. And of course, today they continue to make tourist art, and you have uh, wood carvings that are kind of ebony-like. Usually, they're covered with shoe polish um, these days, uh, but <coughs> ebony-like carvings, which are not made historically for any particular use. These are purely decorative, made for sale to outsiders. I would say, well, this one. This is a very. This is really quite a lovely little carving. I bought it. I gave it to my daughter, who was a musician. Um, it's, a, and it's one of those that you can buy without guilt when you buy tourist art. You're not, you're not even, you know, there's no uh, problem exporting it. You have no guilt about having something which is, was a consecrated object um, and, or removing something that shouldn't be removed from the country. Today, I would say African artists also do a great deal along the lines of making replicas. That is to say, copies of traditional objects. That are the kinds of things you see when you go into museums, those are quote the traditional objects. Well, you can see a lot of replicas also around these days because that's what people want, that's what you want to buy who are not Africans. Uh, and so that's what African uh, entrepreneurs will sell. Them. And they, they carve, mm -hmm. they're at carving centers and they carve using books uh, that they collect uh, catalogs of museum exhibitions uh, as their models. Uh, so these are replicas made in Benin City where there is a very active carving tradition or brass casting tradition and there are two cast brass objects here which you can look at afterwards. Um, and Benin has been making cast brass or bronze objects since the 15th century in an unbroken tradition. These are older ones, uh, and if you actually want to see some of these wonderful cast copper alloy, brass, or bronze objects, go to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I can't say come to Fitchburg because we don't have any uh, pre-1900 bronzes uh, in our collection. But the Museum of Fine Arts just received a gift of 27 pre-1900 uh, bronzes from the Benin Kingdom and they put a, built, created a special gallery for them, and they're beautifully displayed, and it's certainly worth uh, walking through. But you can see here the, the horn blower, which is, this is the uh, a prototype, you might say, and this is the, the replica, the horseman, and again, you see the, the replica there. I'm gonna digress slightly, because this, I think, you, this, these things are made using the lost wax uh, casting technique, and this is a diagram that shows how they're made. Basically, you have a clay uh, core, which is covered with wax. A lot of the detail is created by modeling the wax. That, uh, once it's finished, it's encased in more clay. Uh, channels called screws are, are created uh, using tubes of wax uh, and clay so that they can, you, they can both, when the uh, mold, which is, this is, is heated, the wax will melt and it can be poured out. And then molten metal is poured in to the uh, mold and it fills the places where the wax got lost uh, from being heated and melted and poured away. It's then allowed to cool and the mold is broken away and you have the finished piece. 
So even though a mold is used, each one of these is unique because a new mold has to be made for each one. It's not a reusable mold. Um, and brass casting is still done. Today, you see here um, a man creating a figure like this uh, using uh, putting the beeswax decoration onto the, the, uh, the covering, which is of the figure, uh, which will eventually look like this once it's finished. Uh, and this was photographed in 2004 in Benin City. And this is the casting process. I mean, this is the, it's open pit casting. There is at least one gas-fired foundry in the area where these, this is done in Benin City, but only one. Most people are still, still use outdoor uh, charcoal fires to, to heat the molds and pour the wax out to melt the uh, bronze or to, uh, and pour it, pour it in. And then, of course, uh, once the mold is broken away, the objects have to, are often filed and uh, repaired in some cases if necessary. So I have two bronzes here. This was actually a gift to me. It's a, it's a contemporary bronze. It's not, uh, it's not a particularly good casting. It has a great deal of meaning for me because it, I had an audience with the Oba or King of Benin. And I gave him a copy of the book that I had written. And at the end of my, uh, this audience, he, he produced this and gave it to me. Now it was left over, I think, for, uh, from a bunch of favors he had made to give out to other traditional rulers at a conference that he was, uh, that he had uh, chaired. But he gave it to me, and his sister, who, who was uh, my colleague at the University of Benin, she's a ceramicist, said to me, uh, I didn't know he was going to give you anything. She was really impressed. Uh, so I had to, was also sufficiently impressed. But, uh, but I'll, I'll pass it around. It, it can be handled. It's probably good for it to be handled, keep it polished. Thank you. <laughs> This, on the other hand, has been and is is also new. I will tell you that right now. This is not this is not a pre yeah, a 16th century or 17th century cast copper alloy uh, ornament. It would have been worn by uh, at the hip as part when the king wrapped his uh, kind of guard. They call them wrappers in English. Anyway, they were, his his wrapper around him. Was, uh, it would have been part of the belt uh, that was used to kind of hold things up or attached to the knot. And it's uh, the face of a king. I showed this to a colleague of mine in England on my way home. I bought this last November. And he looked at me, he turned it over and he looked at it. This is quite nicely finished on the inside. He looked at me and I said, I said, John, this was made last month. I have a picture of the artist who made it and his name, it is not, oh, so he said, well, they, they, they've really gotten better at doing this. And of course, it's been, dark, it's been antiqued, so it looks old. Uh, but it uh, is, in fact, a very new one. And, and it's, I'll start this one on this side, so you can look at it. But it's a very traditional piece in terms of its, the way it looks. Um, and it could easily be mistaken by somebody who didn't know the material, by me, for example. Uh, I mean, I know the material, but I don't know it that well. Uh, SS being better than it actually is. So you have to be rather careful uh, when you're looking at African art. Because you can find a lot of these replicas around here, as well as other places. This is Brimfield. This was, uh, uh, I was, I mean, I also, I also photographed last, in July, last May, but these are uh, these are these are leopards from the foundries and the workshops in Benin. Just <clears throat> did you see it? Just check to do this. Okay. Now you can see the same leopards or the same types out up here being sold by one of the African traders at Brimfield. I've been working with the traders now for three to four years because I think their stories are interesting. Um, if, these are Benin bronze uh, heads that replicate altar pieces uh, and from the, the, the 15th and 16th century. These are plaques, which are a traditional type. This is a, a somewhat less 
uh, skilled work in the sense that it's probably not made in Benin, but made in the neighboring country of Cameroon, where there's also a very large brass casting tradition, but their style is very different. So it's, it's a much more extroverted uh, face. This is a much more typical Benin face, the smaller features and so on. Whereas this one with this big, the big eyes and the kind of puffy cheeks, that's, that's, that's the style of Cameroon wood carving as well. So it's, it's hard for an artist sometimes to mask the way he's been traditionally trained uh, when he's making, even when he's making a copy of something else. Okay, today's artists uh, also include a group of people now who were trained in workshops. And it's starting in the 1930s in the colonial period. Western artists and uh, colonial officers wanted to do two things. They wanted to see what it would, would happen if they trained people who did not have Western art training, did not know about using perspective or do things that looked like photographs in you know, naturalism, um, what kind of art they would produce. And the other thing they wanted to, to do was give people a way to make some money so they could make something they could sell to the the people who were beginning to come through, colonial officers, um, businessmen, and so on, who wanted souvenirs to take home. Um, and so the, this is, happens to be a Nigerian group. And the, the work tends to be, uh, at what was emphasized was a, quote, primitive character, an expressionistic character, but primitive in the sense of untrained or untutored, just like Grandma Moses, for example. Um, and you have very, and they, they, they're very attractive. Uh, these artists have become very successful financially selling to, they now sell in uh, galleries in New York and, and Washington. But uh, they were not trained in art school. They weren't trained in the, the old apprenticeship method either, but through this short uh, term workshop where they were introduced to new materials and media. It wasn't only in Nigeria. This happened. It also happened in, this, these are from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But again, you get a very similar uh, uh, results in the sense of very flat, stylized images, not naturalistic at all. Uh, and the subject matter tends to be either uh, narrative about how things are done. In this case, it was carrying uh, You've got women carrying water from the river. And the river, of course, is shown by all these fish kind of flipped up so you have that, you know, like almost like wallpaper behind the people uh, walking as a decorative pattern. Or animals, which is, of course, what people, most people from Europe and America think about when they think of Africa. What do they think about? They think about animals. Even though, in fact, uh, that's probably not most what was uh, by most African artists did not depict animals in their, their traditional work. They depicted people. Um, and of course, artists today are university trained, uh, in both in Africa and their various countries, as well as in uh, Europe. These are both from uh, French-speaking Africa, from Senegal, both of these artists. This is a tapestry, which is, uh, and the, and the images they used, and this is in the early colonial period especially, they had an agenda. And their agenda was to uh, create an art that was, quote, African, but pan-African, not specific to a particular ethnic group, but pan or even a specific country, but pan-African. So they used what they considered African imagery, uh, masks, uh, sculpture, which reflected back on the, the traditional carvings and so on, and incorporated those in the paintings, which were kind of impressionistic, kind of cubist. Um, in fact, both of these artists are probably trained in France, because it's a French-speaking area. Um, but uh, you know, they, were, they, were, they were a very modern statement about, an, about a, nat a new national idea about belonging to a country, not an ethnic group. Um, but they paint in many different styles today. Uh, this is a work by an artist, one of my colleagues at the University of Benin, who's considered the best colorist on staff. 
He's, he, he works in a highly naturalistic manner. Um, he's very successful within Nigeria. He wouldn't sell a painting on the international market. But he's very successful within Nigeria because most people there, just like most people here, don't want to hang something on their walls, which they understand. They don't want to hang something, they're, they're not, not necessarily into the international art market uh, in most communities, he, either here or there. This happens to be an image of the current Oba of Benin, when he just after he took office, when he was in his 40s, he's now 40, that was 40 years ago, um, and showing him, and you see he's dressed this is a, an image of the oboe of Benin. He's got, the, he's got his crown on, and it's, made, and it's made of coral beads. And that's what's referenced here in the uh, costume of this figure. And this, of course, is a, uh, just an image showing women dancing in a traditional uh, community dance. They also work in much more abstract ways. These are both uh, contemporary Nigerian artists. Uh, whose work sells both at home now because there's a, the beginnings of a new art of a, of a contemporary art market among the middle class and the wealthy in Nigeria who are buying and beginning to invest uh, in art. And of course they work in many media. Uh, they're not only painters, they're not only sculptors, they are also there are some superb photographers. Both of these are photographers from the Niger Delta. And of course, these, they're not only doing making uh, works that express personal concerns, but express in very important social concerns as well. The Niger Delta uh, is where they are dealing with both, with what I would call the burden and the curse of oil. This is called oil slick. And you can see that somebody with his hands just, and water, this is what the water looks like when the oil leaks. We know, we know about that from our own, from our own Delta areas in this country. Um, and this is the, uh, the Bonnie Gas Works, where unfortunately, which is down in the Niger Delta, they burn off all the gas. All the natural gas is burned off mm. instead of being harnessed and used. Um, and which also creates environmental problems uh, at the same time. So, and many of these university trained artists who are selling not only at home but abroad, you might describe as transnational artists. And again, we have Sakari Douglas Camp, uh, who is our woman who works in welded metal. And when you come to Fitchburg in November, you will see her drummers, which were last shown here before they uh, returned to Europe and came back to Fitchburg at the Smithsonian in 1987 as part of a large installation. And they're kinetic, and so you can hear them when they, when they beat the drums. Um, or an artist like Inka Shonabari, who is also an Anglo-Nigerian, uh, who is, a, again, uh, what he's done here is he's uh, created a sculpture, an installation, after a well-known uh, European painting from the 18th century called The Swing. Uh, surprise. <laughs> Uh, and what he's done, though, is really interesting. He's taken a two-dimensional work of art and turned it into a three-dimensional work of art. What, what European artists did around the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century did, they took three-dimensional works of art from Africa and turned them into two-dimensional works. It's Cuba's painting. So what he's doing is he's kind of playing a, a reverse game there and, uh, and making a comment of, about that. So. Summing up, I'm not finished yet, though, even though you might hope I am. <laughs> but anyway, African artists make art as it always was. Just to, uh, they also make traditional forms that have been updated in various ways. They have developed new forms to serve old needs. They've developed new forms to serve new needs. Um, and indeed, they also make things for sale to, outsi uh, well, to outsiders on the one hand that they don't make for themselves, the tourist art and the airport art. And they make um, things that uh, they do sell to outsiders as well as to their own people if, if they can, can, if people, they can get people to buy them, uh, which are expressed personal as well as social concerns, like the artists in any other part of the world. Today, who are who are functioning um, 
in that global context. Okay, if there are four different ways that people actually become artists. And just to remind you, they can apprentice, that's the old way. Uh, they can teach themselves. I actually didn't talk about that. They can, they, can, they, can, they can see something and then try it. And that's one of the ways people uh, also historically um, made things. Uh, they saw something that their neighbors were doing. If they traveled and, and they saw new masquerades or, or something, and they came home and tried it and tried to make it the, uh, themselves. There are also workshops that give short courses and teach people new media. And there, of course, there's the long term, longer term formal training in universities and art schools. But we also have artists of African descent who, uh, in the Americas, who brought their art or their culture with them and continued to make things. And so when you come to Fitchburg in November, you will see an Abaqua masquerade. Not, not these very ones, but very similar to them, because they are traditional forms not generally made for the outside world, but commissioned uh, by uh, an academic, in this case in Cuba. I commissioned one of these in Nigeria. This mask from Cuba was brought with people who were forcibly moved from Africa to the Caribbean in the starting, what, in the 16th, certainly in the 16th century, but have most heavily in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, uh, along with a whole social organization um, and they have continued to make this and use this masquerade uh, in Cuba. So it's, it's still these days. It, they're performed in Florida today, actually. And they have become, besides their traditional use, they are part of the, the, uh, the folklore troupe, the, the, uh, which the Cuban government sponsors, of, of traditional dances from Cuba. It derives specifically from this masquerade, from the Niger Delta. Um, and indeed, in terms, of, and this has been as well documented in terms of the language of the chanting and the songs, is still recognized, is recognizable by the people from this area. They've been, and one of the more recent kind of interesting research projects uh, going on has been getting the Cuban practitioners of Abaqua uh, together with the, practi the practitioners of the leopards, who belong to the Leopard Society from the Niger Delta. In both cases, these were traditional forms of government. These were the kind of emblems of traditional forms of government. Uh, in the case of Cuba, helping people to kind of deal with their situation and uh, keep on striving for freedom within uh, the Cuban context. And here, it was simply kind of look, it was the form of government prior to the colonial period, when uh, a different kind of government then took over some of the, the functions. But you'll see examples of both of these, which you won't see any place else in the United States. If you come to Fitchburg, um, there are also artists of African descent in the Americas who are simply inspired by traditional African art forms. This is a guy named Willie Cole, who is uh, from Newark, New Jersey. He grew up in New Jersey. His parents are uh, and grandparents um, were in, lived in America before him. Um, and he, like as did I, learned about African art by going to school and going to museums and studying things. And he has made, this, this, this is one of the kinds of things that he's made, but it, they're called bicycle chihuahua. Chihuahua is the name <coughs> of this antelope headdress from, the, uh, from Mali, uh, which is very well known. And uh, he was inspired by these forms. Uh, the Fitchburg Art Museum has just commissioned a Willie Cole. Willie had a, an exhibit in Worcester uh, in 2007, and I met him at that point because I was writing something for the Worcester Art Museum. Uh, but uh, he has just made us a bicycle chihuahua, and we will be displaying it with the, a selection of the traditional ones uh, that it uh, is linked to. Uh, or they are, ch are, are African artists like Inka Shonabari with his, his image, The Swing, or uh, this artist named Fred Wilson, challenging European uh, American artists about the adoption or appropriation, the taking over of African forms without acknowledging it. And so he's made this wonderful piece, uh, which is a, a complete, uh, it's, an, it's a reproduction of 
Pablo Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, uh, which is considered the first major Cubist painting. And he put over the most Africanized face a mask like this one, which you will see at the Fitchburg Art Museum. You will not see this at the Fitchburg Art Museum, but you will see this, this one. Um, and named it Whose Rules? Whose Rules was Picasso using when he made this painting? He was using basically the rules of African art, not the rules of European art in 1907. And he did not, Picasso refused to admit until 1940 that African art had any influence on him. Yet here he is photographed in 1908 in his studio with lots of stuff all around him. And by 1974, this was uh, in the process of being moved for, ex for an exhibition, all of his Afri a lot of his African uh, sculpture. I mean, he collected African art very early, like many artists from uh, at that time in Paris. Yet they didn't want to acknowledge that they were being inspired by this primitive, I say that in quotes, art. Because there's nothing primitive about it. Um, it's highly evolved, uh, and it's intentional. It's not a failed naturalistic uh, image. It is an intentionally abstract uh, image. Okay. That being said, I would like to just very briefly refocus attention on the traditional African artists, the guys, the, the, guys, the men and women who learned through the apprenticeship method, and, and give you just a couple of examples of what they thought about themselves and what their communities thought about them, how they were trained. We know that. We've already talked about that, the apprenticeship. Where they got their inspiration from, that's, that's actually interesting, how their communities looked at them, and basically on how they saw themselves. And I also want to address and say something briefly about the idea of anonymity. That was part of the title. You know, anonymous doesn't live here anymore. When you go to a museum, you'll see, you, never, you very rarely, and you see traditional African art, you very rarely see the artist's name. I'm going to talk about that. When you go to a museum, this is often usually what you see. It's actually it's getting a little more interesting now. There are more pictures, there are more, movie, there are more videos showing things that happen and so on. But what you don't <coughs> usually see is you don't see, um, say, a cluster of objects of the same type from the same area. So this, these are these antelope headdresses, like our bicycle chihuahua. Um, they're all in very much the same style, uh, but they're clearly made by different artists. If you look at them carefully, you can see they're, they're, they're not exact, they're not cookie cutter reproductions. Uh, they're made by individual hands. Now, most museums don't show this. Generally, they don't have the material in their collections to be able to do this. Uh, it's not because they intentionally want to uh, you know, befuddle you or not help you develop your eye, but it's because they really don't have the depth in their collections. Sometimes I think they think it's just a little bit redundant. Uh, they all, uh, but so you, you tend to see a lot of things from a lot of different ethnic groups. So of course they don't look alike exactly. But you don't ever see things like this, which do look alike, but which have a lot of minimal or at least small variations because it's an individual uh, creation. It's a little bit like the performance of a music piece. There's a form like you have the score of your, your music, you know, your song, and you, you perform it, and a number of people can perform the same thing, but it's always, it's a little different each time, because each performer is different. Each performers have different levels of skill, so some, some performers, this is gonna be good, some aren't gonna be so good. The same is true of carvers, who are working with a traditional form, which they've been asked to make, because they're commissioned, usually. Uh, they don't just make them on spec unless they're making them for sale to tourists now. Uh, but they, uh, and they have to have a certain, they have to represent what it's been asked for. I mean, it's a little bit like if in, in the Catholic Church, for example, if you go in and you want to buy a statue of St. Peter and the carver turns up with a statue of, you know, uh, of Mary with the Christ child, you're gonna say, but I didn't order that. That's not what I want, it doesn't, it doesn't you know, I need something for my shrine to St. Peter. I don't need something for a shrine to, to, the, to uh, you know, to Mary, <coughs> so that uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't accept. And that's the same kind of thing. These have a particular purpose. They have a, an iconography, a set form. People look at them. They know what they are. They know what they should look like. 
at least in general terms, and then they can also appreciate the variation uh, because they're familiar with the form. African objects, basically, uh, as in, these are a group of twin figures from Nigeria. These are two little twin figures, and I'll hand them around. And they like to be handled because they're children of wood. <coughs> and, and it's good, I'm sorry, I'll hand this one around. Uh, in terms of how they were made and used, they were usually, they, they are memorial figures for a deceased twin. The Yoruba had a, a very high incidence of twin birth prior to modern medicine. Of course, many of those twins died. They're uh, premature. Often they were born prematurely. They were lower, you know, lower birth weights than a single birth. It was a famine year. This was before supermarkets, you know, when people grew what they uh, ate. And if they didn't have a good year, they didn't get enough to eat. A mother might not be able to feed twins. Something like uh, one in uh, one in seven births is a twin birth among the aura, but it's a very high incidence of twinning. Um, and so many of these were required. But these things, I mean, I, you, I can look at that, and even if I'd never seen it before, I could say, that's a Yoruba twin figure. How do I know that? Well, it has a particular set of, of uh, facial forms that are, I recognize. They're always about between 8 and, and 12 feet inches high. They almost always stand in that way with their arms like this or like this, with their feet flat on the ground. But they're, except they're not on the ground. They're either on a little base or they're wearing sandals, like as this one is. They don't stand barefoot on the ground. Um, and over time, of course, the, because they are considered, they're a little bit like the Victorian photographs that people took of children who died when they were infants and kept in their family albums. This bears the name of the child that died and is treated like a living child. It's given gifts, so that's why, and, and washed and bathed and fed, so it eventually gets a, a kind of patina of wear. The, the features get smoothed um, over, and you can tell that they've been handled because they have been cared for, sometimes by the mother, sometimes by the living, the living sibling, the living twin and eventually by a relative after all of the immediate relatives um, have passed away. But we know that they are uh, what they are, but they're carved by every Yoruba carver. This is one of those traditions that happens to go across all of the Yoruba speaking areas. So this is a pair, and there's one in that group that is in the same style as this one. Can anybody find it? No, the same oh. style, this, this one of these. Now, I'm not actually going three-dimensional to two-dimensional. We're just doing two-dimensional to two-dimensional here. But if you look at, look at their faces and see which one, uh, and if anybody's willing to make a guess, I'll give you my pointer. We do know the names of some artists. The real problem is we don't know the names of a lot of these traditional artists because they didn't sign their work. Why didn't they sign their work? They didn't have to. They generally served a fairly small community, uh, and people knew who their carvers were, they knew the styles, they knew what they wanted, they knew what they could afford. And they went, if they, when they had a need, they went to the artist whose work they liked and they could afford. So they, the artist didn't need to, to, to sign his name. Yeah. Um, so, and of course we don't have many written records. These, these were cultures that kept their records in oral form, historically, not in written form. Um, but you do have lots of oral records. This was a praise song for a, a great uh, late 19th century, early 20th century carver uh, sung by the wife of the, the artist about uh, how, what an outstanding carver he was. Um, he carved the hard wood as though it were as soft as a, as a calabash or a gourd because um, he was that skilled. He, you know, he made it seem easy. Uh, and so on, so praising his skill, and so on. And we're going to see hear what these three artists have to say, and then, then I will, uh, about uh, how they feel about themselves. Uh, I just would remind you that Africa is a continent and not a country, that there are 53 countries uh, in Africa, there are 3,000 eth ethnic groups in Africa. They all have their own ideas. So ideas about an artist in one 
community or culture are not necessarily going to be the same as in another community or culture. Among the Yoruba, who have a very, very large populous culture, uh, highly differentiated, they've lived in cities for a thousand years, actually. Um, artists are actually quite respectable. It's, it, it's, it's, not, it's prestigious to be an artist, to be a good artist. You can be an artist and be a traditional ruler. It's not against the rules of being a ruler to use your hands to make something like this. Um, but artists were considered quite respectable. And if you were an artist, it was because it was part of the destiny, your destiny, which was assigned at birth by God. And that, de that natural talent was then sharpened into skill by training and practice. That's, how, that's the way artists are made everywhere, basically. Um, among the Ashanti of Ghana, again, the artists were considered uh, quite normal human beings. They weren't expected to be peculiar or emotional or anything. They had to be a good farmer and a good businessman uh, to be respected in the community. They could still be an artist, but they had to, if they didn't have a farm and show good business sense, they, they weren't, they weren't going to be respected. The, among the goal of Liberia, artists were the kind of people you did not want your daughter to marry. You, if your son st sh started showing signs of wanting to be a carver, you would practically break his fingers. Artists were dangerous. They worked with spiritual objects. They brought danger into the, the household. They brought danger to the community. But they were needed. They were necessary. But you definitely didn't want them in your family, and you didn't want, it's like, not in my backyard. <laughs> so the very different attitudes towards artists in these communities which aren't that far apart. I mean, they're several hundred miles apart, very different different, different cultures. Uh, where do artists get their inspiration in Africa? Like artists everywhere, they look around them. They get inspiration from the traditional forms that they are meant to be uh, continuing to create. But they also make things that look like the people who are around them. And one of the reasons you don't actually realize that is because you only ever see the objects. You never see them next to the people from the same communities. So these are children from the royal, fam royal family in Ghana. And you can see they're practicing the, the look, which is this kind of uh, royal look which you see uh, stylized on the faces of these memorial terracotta figures, uh, which, are, which, which they know about. Uh, here you have from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, from the Mangbetu. The Mangbetu actually meant, meant massage their children's heads, so they would have this long, elegant oval head shape develop if you were royal. Um, and you can see the artist has replicated that. He hasn't just made, made that elongated head up. He's looking at the people around him and copying, you know, or stylizing what he sees. Again, the hairstyle on this figure is, again, not an art in the artist's imagination. It's a particular hairstyle called the hornbill, which old women wear um, because it has a particular ritual and historical significance. So they look to see the world around. Now they often don't, they won't say that. They'll say they dreamt it because they're not supposed to be innovative. They're supposed to be following a, a pattern. They're not supposed to be making big changes in these things which people have certain expectations of. Um, so they will often say they got their, their inspiration from dreams uh, or the outside, not that they, that they made it up. But in fact, they really are doing a lot of looking right around themselves when they make their choices. There's also a big question about the idea of creativity. We often don't see the creativity in individual forms. Think of those four antelope headdresses again, because we often don't see them. We're not familiar enough with them. Well, do Africans think of their artists as creative? And I would say the answer is yes, they do, in different cultures, and they express it in different ways. Among the, again, this is an Akan chief uh, king from Ghana. And, you know, we have an enormous Ghanaian population here in central Massachusetts. Uh, and you can see Ghanaian at certain events, you can see people wearing their traditional uh, clothing and their traditional gold and so on here. Well, when a, when a, 
uh, a chief or a king uh, be takes office, he becomes, it's said, they don't call it, it being enthroned, they call it being enstooled, because the stool is the throne. He will commission a whole new set of things uh, for, his new, for his reign, often with a message associated with the motifs that are used. And he calls the carver to, when who, that he has commissioned, it, uh, symbolically, my wife. Why? Because the carver is giving the body, is creating the body of the objects uh, according to the, uh, the ideas which the king has expressed as a woman basically gives birth to the child of her husband. So there's a, a, a real link there between the idea of, of the creativity of childbirth, uh, which is the kind of the natural metaphor, and the creativity of the artist in a cultural uh, Zra, who is an uh, artist from Liberia, basically has said to the anthropologist who inter interviewed him, my name Zra means God. This is what my people call me. Because like God, I create something from nothing. I take a piece of wood and I turn it into something. Uh, this is an artist I worked with, a woman who was a textile designer. She was a praise singer. She did wall paintings. Uh, she, she did this very special cloth, which she is wearing here. And I want to actually read what she said to me, because it's, I think it's, it's very moving. She's it's not very long. Um, to say how, how, what she thinks of herself. OK, she said to me in 2003, now I have to admit, I feel very guilty about this. I was very grateful. I worked with her in the 70s. She was over 100, she said. Uh, I don't know if she was really over 100 in 2003, but she was certainly very old. I was very grateful she was still alive. I had never collected her autobiography. I collected the autobiographies of my wood carving artists, my men. But I never, even though I hung out with her all the time, I documented all the things she did, I never asked me to tell her her story. Talk about gender bias, unconscious gender bias. I mean, but she was, she said, to, and she said to me, said an artist is known by her talent. She said this in her own language, of course. Um, my voice first brought me recognition because she was a singer. When you first came, my voice was still there. She was a younger, she was 30 years younger. Um, you met me doing handwork, that is say painting and weaving and textile design. You were interested in that. The information and the work you took from me is what you will be showing other white people forever. Now, is this somebody who, who wants to be anonymous? Is this somebody who doesn't respect herself as an artist? No. She is somebody who has a great deal of sense of herself uh, and the value and worth of what she does. Lawrence Ajanaku, who was one of the ones whose biography I did collect back in the uh, in the 70s and in 2003 and again in 2013 because he's still alive he's still uh, making costumes this is one that's in the smithsonian that i commissioned from him and brought back uh, for an exhibit in 2004. Uh, the british the british museum he just finished what might be his last commission because he's certainly in his 80s now um, he's been sick, sick off and on during this whole commission for the British Museum for one of this a pair of these uh, costumes which will go on display. But he said to me basically, um, uh, when I commissioned things for him in, 19, in the 1970s for the university, which I uh, worked for and was getting my PhD in the University Museum in California, he said to me at the end of this, uh, take these costumes take these costumes home and tell the people of the United States that this is what came from the hands of Lawrence Sajana. This is not an anonymous artist. This is not an artist who doesn't value what he does. But I think the final word really belongs to Zra, who's uh, is the one whose name means God. Um, and this always makes me cry. So if I, if I have a hard time finishing it, you won't, you'll forgive me. Um, the last carving that Sra made was this ladle that, that terminated in a human hand. Okay, and he, uh, and this is not an uncommon design in, 
this, his traditional sculpture. But he explained his use of this design in this way. And revealing what I consider an exquisite sense of his own, again, sense of himself as an artist and the value of what he did. When my sickness overcame me, I felt this meant the end of my work. I wanted to carve one last big spoon. And on it, I carved my sculptor's hand as it closed itself forever. It's an incredible, incredible statement. Took a full hour, but I'm happy to, to answer questions if anybody has any. Um, I said, I hope you all join me in Fitchburg. We open November 2nd, which is a Sunday. The show will be up for two years, though, so you know, if you don't, can't make it on November 2nd, it's not a disaster. Um, and as I said, three, uh, basically three or four days later, I'm getting on a plane and going back to Nigeria to teach at the University of Benin in Benin City. Um, I was, uh, I've been awarded a second Fulbright, to, which is what's taking me back. Um, and so I'm very pleased to be going back to join my colleagues there. And I continue working with them and A, professionalizing the department as well, much as teaching the students because many of the uh, people in the department have never been able to travel abroad. Uh, internet is spotty, shall we say. Uh, internet provided by the university is almost impossible. So what you have to do is you, we have something called a personal modem, which you, you plug in as a US, the USB port into your computer. It has a little phone card in it, and you dial, you, you, can, you, can, you buy internet time, pay as you go. You know, Nigeria has a, an unfortunate reputation uh, for uh, fraud. So there's, a, there's almost nothing that you buy which is a, 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 on a contract basis where you get billed on a monthly basis. Everything is pay as you go. Um, and I actually, I mean, it's, well, actually it's wonderful now because I can say in 1973, A, there wasn't, we didn't know about the internet anyway, even here. But I certainly didn't know about it there. Uh, but what I can do now is I can put my modem in, call up Clark University's library, and go on to the database and download the articles that I need for my students to read if we don't have them. I mean, it's a, it's a, it makes it a, a, an amazing difference to the ability to, to teach and for students to have, the, to have the materials to learn from. So I'm hoping that the internet will be our savior in Africa in terms of education. Uh, but it certainly has made an enormous difference. When I first went in, 19, in the early 1970s, I wasn't far away from anything. I could, didn't go anywhere that I couldn't go in my little Volkswagen Beetle. I mean, I it wasn't so I was paddling a canoe down some, you know, kind of creek in a tropical uh, environment. I didn't work in the Niger Delta, or I would have been doing that. But it was, you know, I was. It was actually the area that I worked in looked like New England, except there were palm trees. It was kind of hilly with rocky outcrops. Very somewhat drier. It not, wasn't as humid as uh, places a little bit further south. Lots of microclimates like New England. Um, but there were no communication. The communication was a problem. The phone didn't work. The telegraph didn't work. If somebody wanted to see me, they got in a car and drove. Um, and of course, the mail was bad. It was particularly bad after my father sent me money by mail which of course was discovered. So no mail ever came to me again, <laughs> unless it was in an air letter. I can't say, write air letters. Don't send anything in an envelope because it will be, you know, checked on. Um, and then it won't get passed, passed along. Uh, so that, but it was like walking off the edge of the world in terms of communications. Uh, even though it wasn't very far away from anything, um, you know, but it was still, it felt very distant um, because it was hard to communicate with people. And that, that has changed enormously now. I mean, I can, even though Skype isn't very reliable because the internet connections aren't great, um, I can in fact sometimes talk to my granddaughter or my 
children or my husband um, on Skype. So it's not quite as bad as being um, really far away in the same way you know, being distant from your family uh, used to be. Thank you very much.